Wow, smell that, that's great, isn't it? <laughs> Glasgow was a, a real centre of computing expertise and, you know, progress in the, the 1950s. Wow, isn't that exciting? So this is apart from the original machine at Glasgow, the Juice. Um, this is a mercury delay line amplifier. In the olden days, it would have been attached to a long tube, maybe a four or five foot long, that would have contained liquid mercury. This thing here is centimetres in, in size, and um, the modern day equivalent would be a very small piece of silicon, kind of, you know, nanometers across, which would be a, a transistorized component that would store a single, um, you know, word of, of memory. So this is the only part of the machine that we have left. In 60 years, computers have become, you know, um, millions of times more powerful than they were you know, back in 1957 when we got our first machine. It's such a broad discipline. Like you think it's all, you know, make people that view computer science as very technical, it's all about, you know, hardware or about programming. But there's, there's that, there's endless applications. You can do almost anything. You know, if, if suddenly you think, well, actually, I think the interesting issue in computing is to do with water reclamation in South Africa. That's a perfectly valid area of study. We are applying what we're doing in so many areas, in genetics, in politics, in so sociology, in engineering, maths, etc. Well, that's kind of cool as well, because it means that uh, you might enter thinking that you're definitely going to do this topic. By the time that you get to fourth year, the world's moved on. And there's a huge amount of freedom for people to decide whether they want to specialise in artificial intelligence, big data, cyber security. So when you're teaching computer science, I think you always have this interesting tension between the abstract principles that underlie what you're trying to teach about and an example, a practical application of it and, and addressing a motivation. If you have a process, well, a, a process you might think of start, you know, has a start and some steps and a stop as a kind of te technical definition. But when you start looking at the world in terms of processes, then you start getting this very, very rich understanding of what's actually happening out there. Computer science to me is fundamentally about computation. It's about the process of going through a computation. There's a long history of, of algorithms and doing things in a systematic, algorithmic way. It's the technology that's got the shorter history. There are core things about computing that will not change. Um, and they're generic skills that have remained the same almost since the days that computing began. The actual thinking that comes behind the computer, because after all, it's likely that these kind of machines that we have just now won't be around in 50 years. But the fundamental thinking about things in computational terms is, is lasting. You can wake up literally and look at the newspapers or read a paper from a company or from an individual and you think, OK, the world has changed. That means that we need to be flexible in how we teach and also the subjects that we teach. It's like gone from Neanderthal to modern day without the intervening civilization, right? It is. It's in the last, I mean, when was the f first proper computer built? You know, perhaps in the Second World War or something like that, or just before it. So you're talking about you know, 70, 80 years ago, whatever to today is just unbelievable. It's fantastic to remember that, you know, Alan Turing designed a machine which we eventually installed here in Glasgow, but I think you still have to keep your feet on terra firma and remember that, you know, people use that machine to do real problems, solve real, um, you know, mathematical and engineering challenges in the 50s and 60s. Um, so I think when I had a look at the catalogue for computing, you had five or six boxes of materials. Dr. Dennis Gillies was the, the main influence in terms of convincing the university authorities that we needed a computer. But you know how things work in a university, unless people at the top really want something to happen, it doesn't. So I think there was definitely an institutional enthusiasm for computing. Quotation and specifications, that's what we want, isn't it? So it's 112. <gasps> Draft spec and costing. We have pleasure in giving below our full quotation for Juice Computer. That's really funny. Price, here we go, £49,100. The purchase of the machine, I think it shows that 
um, the, the government of the day and the funding bodies of the day had confidence that Glasgow was the place for computing in Scotland. You know, the university also itself wanted to make a commitment to this new discipline because the machine cost 50000 and the university was earning them 40000 so they had to raise the rest of the capital themselves. I don't remember the sort of first generation of people that were in, in computing in Glasgow, but I certainly have spoken to people that were, you know, recruited two, three, four, five years after the thing started. That's, that's mind-blowing for me. You know, within my lifetime, I've seen the development of a topic, you know, a whole topic at university level that's now a thousand people may be involved in it. It was quite small when I was there. There was only three or four houses in Lillibank that held the whole department. So everything was new, so it was all very exciting, right? Learning how to program a big computer, though we never saw it. All we did was hand in some punch cards into a, a drawer or a table somewhere like that and they disappeared and a day later you got a listing back and things like that. We became experts at writing your program, you checked it and hand checked it and checked it again and then checked it for a third time. I suppose when we installed our juice machine in 1958, computing was a very small part of the university and now there's a machine on every desk and effectively a computer in everyone's pocket with their smartphone. The place started very very small you can imagine like in the internet expansion everybody wanted to do computing so we went from classes where you know maybe had 60 students to 300, 400, 450. So I came to Glasgow uh, just at the beginning of 1988 and the reason I came is because suddenly there was a big buzz out in the community about Glasgow University and computing science. And what had happened is the principal at the time, Sir Alwyn Williams, I think a couple of years earlier had realised the potential of computing science and he hired three new professors, Keith Van Rijsbergen, Malcolm Atkinson and John Hughes. There's that Glasgow spirit that we had, you know, when I came here and I don't ever want to lose that. And so I think we have to keep telling people what it was like then. We had a really young attitude in, in the department. Everybody was good. And I think looking back just reminds you, yeah, it was pretty industrial back then, if I can use that word, right? And so there are things you can learn from the past, right? Being careful about how you, how you write the code and how you look at it and how you, you, know, you test it and things like that. If I talk to my kids about basic technologies that they have around them, they, they just can't believe the transition. Now why that's really important is if you can't imagine a world without mobile phones and without credit cards you're really unprepared for what the next 20 years might look like. But I've got the Ladybird book of computing like from the 1970s. How it works, the computer, a Ladybird book, right? <laughs> Okay. It was imperative to get in the machine and I clearly remember feeling really naughty but taking my screwdriver to the back of the box to see what was in it, you know, and look at that, I mean, of course you can't do anything with it, but there's still something, you know, back in those days, and that was amazing, all those chips all getting on doing whatever they do. It's fun reading about stuff and, you know, hearing about stuff second hand but actually, you know, holding the bits of machinery and the uh, documentation and so on in your hands is, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, feeling that, that link with the past very, uh, very closely. And to hear about the past and then to hear some of the colleagues now talk about what they were working on, I was so proud of them and I was so interested. But it is a reflection on where we've come and why it's a great department, I think. The kind of legacy, the history, the people who have made the department. It's interesting to see that some of the problems that you're facing today are the, they're the same problems that people were facing there. And again, it's, the machine isn't the important part. It's how they got over those problems and the way they were thinking. <laughs> My first day in university, and Bill said, eh, hands up all those of you who have done computing in school. So, oh yeah. He says, forget everything you know. <laughs> I have a tremendous respect for the people that were here before. They created the culture that enabled me to grow myself and to be continually challenged in computing. So they're an interesting group of lecturers, probably a bit different from your standard group. You know, lit that fire in a number of people and, you know, looking back at what people in my class did, I think they all went on to some pretty good things. The key principles and the key values that I have in teaching computing were learnt from them. Um, and as head of school, I'm really trying my best to pass that on and to make sure that uh, care for the students and a sense of fun and creativity and 
a sense of commitment from the staff to the civic principles of the university are shared. I think these were guys who did a huge amount with, you know, not a lot of budget or, or equipment and, uh, you know, still managed to put on a, a pretty good course, uh, one that was growing in the early 80s, um, and that was all down to their efforts. I think we're quite lucky in that Glasgow University is a great place. Glasgow is a great city to live in. And we do cover a wide diversity of very different computing science research areas. The students are being taught by experts in the area, people who are really passionate about these particular subjects and who know the cutting edge. We also do have to teach, as I've said before, the fundamental mathematical algorithmic stuff, and um, that's not cutting edge research. That's the basic fundamentals, and that has to be taught. But we can even be passionate about that. What we're doing here is we're developing somebody's understanding of process because we recognised that process wasn't really in formal education and the ability to understand representations of and to predict what the representation, the description, you know, what will actually happen and all of that. So here, you know, for example, if we had some massively complicated train track and I pushed that one there and 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 I said, right, the train's going to start here, where's it going to end up? You know, it's not that we want to make everybody a software engineer. We don't need that many software engineers. But what you really want is, you know, doctors that can use computer science if they need to build a particular model, biologists that can use it, you know, artists who can use it to create new installations. The same way that everyone's, you know, taught maths in order to do basic currency and things, you want everyone to be able to interact in some way with, with a machine. get up until you go to bed there is some there's some aspect of what you rely on that re revolves around computers in this room I might probably have uh, 40 different processors doing different things there's a social aspect to that it's not just about technology or the number of processors it's about how you change your life as we move into a world where where the digital and the human gets more and more blurred you know it seems to me that it's important that somebody actually understands what the difference is and, uh, and has some concrete foundation for, you know, what that robot actually is. We always want to do, high, you know, really high class, cutting edge teaching at the same time as research. And we want to teach about the research that we're doing. And those two things, I think, make Glasgow quite unique because we have always cared for our students. We've always worked with our students. University education, often doesn't have as much conversation as you'd like in it. Here, I've turned some of our lecture courses around so that lots and lots of discussion happens in the classroom and, and in the lecture theatre. And the whole purpose of it is to get people practising the language. And we've put that out into the schools in Scotland as well. There isn't that sort of old-fashioned idea of, you know, the unapproachable professor. You know, there's Professor X, he's very senior, don't go and bother him. Uh, it's very much, ah, there's Chris, I'll go and ask him a question. So we're creating opportunities for student innovation and entrepreneurialism. You have to create an environment where people will experiment and do things, different ideas, areas, challenges, people that will disrupt things. We introduce lots of new teaching methods, um, some of them very specifically computing oriented, but this discussion one is not in any particular way. You, know, you, you asked a you know, students have done some work, you ask them a multiple choice question, they vote in some way, whether it's on bits of paper or electronically, and then you get them to discuss their answers in groups, and they're trying to persuade each other why their answer is the right one, and then they vote again. I passionately believe that it enables students to take responsibility for their own education. Part of the kind of Glasgow experience is in your first year you're doing three different topics. So the benefit of that three subject model is they can take computer science, get the kind of feel for thinking in that way, then they go away to biology, perhaps come back and do a PhD, and when they need to use computing, they've already got that sort of idea about how they would think through these sort of problems. The school is in the top 50 of the world's computing departments, but to me, I'm more concerned about creating a, a challenging environment and an innovative environment and supporting the student learning experience, and then the world rankings will follow that. Glasgow has been at the forefront of exciting computing technology and um, innovation 
for the last six decades. Virtual reality uh, back in the, the 70s and the 80s. The Haskell programming language that's now used in places like Facebook and, and Microsoft and other similar large technology companies. Um, and more recently, we've been pioneering computer science education. So in the last 10 or 15 years, there has been a more concerted effort to turn some of those practitioner researchers into more grounded education researchers so that we can start to actually understand ourselves as a discipline with a progression, with a starting point and steps to go through. That's definitely where we're moving over that 60 years and very particularly in the last 15 or 20. And and, and here at the university in, in setting up a centre for computer science education, we're trying to strongly kind of recognise that idea that there's a, there really is a subject to be studied at depth in terms of both research and, and practice and, and policy for the country. It's a big, civic and ancient university, both at the same time. That's pretty unique. You know, it's from 1451, yet it's completely rooted in Glasgow, in the city, in the west of Scotland. And it's so broad, it's a very good place to have these discussions about all the implications of computing from the social to the ethical to the engineering side. So it's a great university to be asking all those research questions because all the people that you want to talk to, they're in this place. So a lot of the, the research that people are doing feeds back into the, the teaching curriculum in some way. So I guess from first year we were doing, like the curriculum now is completely different to the one that I did, but the fundamentals are still there. I can go to a student and I can say, right, do you know, we want to know what the pace of change is in computing. 20 years ago, that was your battery pack. You show them this and you say, okay, when do you think this was used? And a lot of students will say, oh, 1950 or something like that. And you say, well, OK, this was probably uh, 1995, 1996. And for them, that's a long period in the past. But then you say, OK, um, how long might your career last? And some of them will say 40 years, maybe more. And you think, right, OK, so that was under 20 years ago. What's it going to be like in 20 years' time? I can't know all of the computing science areas that they are, but that's why we have lots of colleagues to do that for us. And sharing that knowledge, I think, is really important. This whole building and all the people in it are not about teaching specific programming languages. They're teaching uh, life skills and they're teaching attitudes that will make people resilient and creative and dynamic. And also in terms of our research, if we're still doing what we do today in five years' time, then we will have failed. Computers are ubiquitous. And um, the interesting thing is, although the technology has changed in 60 years, the underlying principles haven't really changed at all. Which is why we can teach computing to you know, fresh generations of students and be confident that in you know, another 60 years' time they'll still be um, able to um, approach the, the subject, the discipline, in um, the same kind of uh, enthusiastic and innovative way as people have been doing for the last 60 years here at Glasgow. Mm -hmm.